Okay, so in our video series on cardiology boot camp and emergency medicine, in this video we'll be talking about atrial fibrillation. We'll discuss that what is atrial fibrillation. We'll discuss that what are the ECG findings in atrial fibrillation. We'll discuss what are the clinical features and examination findings. How do you manage atrial fibrillation in emergency department? We'll also discuss that what is CHAD score, how do you calculate it, and what's its importance. First of all, what is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is a chaotic, irregular atrial rhythm at 300 to 600 beats per minute. It is a chaotic, irregular contraction of atria at a very fast heart rate. At a very fast rate, these atria are contracting. When these atria contract at a very fast heart rate, they do not contract in synchrony. They do not contract in synchrony with the heart. These atrias are literally seizing at that point due to excessive electrical activity. When these atria are seizing in due to excessive electrical activity, they do not contract in a synchronized manner. When they do not contract in a synchronized manner, they do not generate pulse. Therefore, in a patient with atrial fibrillation, what you would see is that when you put steth on the heart, you would see, you would listen that the heart is running at a, such a fast pace. The heart rate is around 300 to 600. But when you check the pulse in these patients, you would see that these patients are having pulse around 80 or 100. So there is a pulse deficit. There is a difference in the pulse when you check it directly through steth over the heart. And when you check the pulse rate, the pulse is lesser. This is called as pulse deficit that you see in atrial fibrillation. The concept behind it is that these atria are running at a, such a fast heart rate. They are literally seizing at that point and they do not contract properly. They do not contract in synchrony. Therefore, they do not generate pulse. So it is a chaotic, irregular atrial rhythm, atrial contraction at a very fast heart rate. It is seizure of atria. If you look at this diagram, this is a normal heart contracting. If you see first these atrias contract, then these ventricles contract and they are contracting in a synchronized manner. What if this atria starts contracting at a very fast rapid rate and that is not synchronized with the heart? What will happen is that heart won't be able to push out the blood to the periphery. So what you will see is that the pulse rate will be lesser than the rate at which the heart is beating. So that is what happens in atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, these atrial muscles are literally seizing due to excessive electrical activity. Now we'll discuss that what is the origin of this abnormal rhythm? What causes this excessive abnormal electrical activity that caused the atria to seize, that causes the atria to contract at an irregular rate? It is most likely found in pulmonary veins. There is a cardiac tissue in pulmonary veins, which is an important ectopic focus that causes abnormal electrical activity and abnormal contraction of the atrial muscles. What causes this formation of abnormal cardiac tissue? The most common cause behind atrial fibrillation is a prolonged hypertensive heart disease. These patients are hypertensive for many years and that hypertensive tension causes hypertrophic changes in the heart. Those hypertrophic changes produce such type of cardiac muscle that generates abnormal activity. Whenever the heart is hypertrophied, that hypertrophied heart can, will cause disturbance in the normal conduction. So a hypertrophied heart in a hypertensive heart disease is a cause of atrial fibrillation. Coronary artery disease, valvular heart disease, COPD, which also causes poor pulmonary and damaged heart hyperthyroidism that causes excessive tachycardia, excessive heart rate, and ultimately heart fails down. Hyperthyroidism, alcohol, and caffeine, they all induce tachycardia. So remember that everything that damages heart will ultimately be a cause of atrial fibrillation. Because when you, when you damage the heart, for a very long time, when you, when you put so much load on the heart for a very long time, there will be changes in the heart tissue and those changes will be pathological. And those changes can lead to abnormal activity and atrial fibrillation. What is a lone atrial fibrillation? When you try to find out the cause and there is no evident cause of atrial fibrillation, it is called as lone atrial fibrillation.
what are the symptoms with which atrial fibrillation can present to you patient with atrial fibrillation are most likely asymptomatic they won't even know that they are having atrial fibrillation and they somehow come to your clinic and when you check their pulse you would find that this patient is having an atrial fibrillation when you do the ecg you find out that that patient is having atrial fibrillation so most often they are asymptomatic but they can often present to you with chest pain palpitation dyspnea and faintness what are the signs the most evident sign that you would see is that when you put hand on the pulse what you would see would be an irregularly irregular pulse and there will be pulse deficit pulse deficit means when you put stress on the heart and you calculate the heart rate at which the heart is beating that would be faster than the pulse that you calculate from the peripheral pulses so that is called as pulse deficit the apical pulse at the heart would be greater than the peripheral pulse in the hands so you will find a pulse deficit in atrial fibrillation what are the investigations the most important investigation in atrial fibrillation is the ecg while you do the ecg you can easily diagnose atrial fibrillation what you would see is that you would see absent p waves and an irregularly irregular rr interval now we'll discuss ecg for a while in ecg we have this p wave a qrs wave and a t wave this p wave occurs due to atrial contraction whenever atria contract it generates the p wave on ecg so remember that in atrial fibrillation we do not have a proper contraction of the atria because those atria are ceasing at that point in time those atria are contracting at such a fast heart rate that do not they do not even produce systole so therefore you won't be able to appreciate p wave because there is no proper atrial contraction going on in atrial fibrillation so you will find absent p wave in ecg now coming to the irregularly irregular rr interval this qrs in ecg shows ventricular contraction and you would be able to appreciate presence of qrs in a fib why qrs is present in afib because the ventricles are fine there is no problem in the ventricles the ventricles are contracting the problem is within the atria but these ventricles are confused they are confused about the signals the signals that are coming from the atria they are they are just confused at what havoc this atria is trying to create up there so the signals coming from the atria are so irregular that these ventricular contractions are also at a irregular rate you will be able to appreciate ventricular contractions but somewhere you will find a qrs at a very rapid rate and sometimes you will find big gaps in between the ventricular contractions so the rr interval the gap between the ventricular contraction would sometimes be less and sometimes it would be much more than expected and it would be totally irregular therefore it is called as irregularly irregular this is the rr interval which would be irregularly irregular now this is a normal ecg in which you can easily appreciate the p wave followed by a qrs complex then a t wave p wave followed by a qrs complex and if you see the rr interval the rr interval is normal it is of equal distance in all of them but if you see a ecg of atrial fibrillation in atrial fibrillation you won't be able to see p waves there are no p waves since there is no contraction of atria in a synchronized manner so there are no p waves these this small wave that you see in between these qrs complexes this is called as fibrillary wave this is due to that abnormal electrical activity in the atria so the first point absent p waves there are no p waves in it coming to the second point irregularly irregular rr interval now if you see this uh, this qrs complexes shows ventricular contraction and look how confused the ventricles are right now sometimes they are contracting at a faster rate and sometimes they just slow down and sometimes they are taking a very long gap so that shows that the ventricles are contracting at an irregular rate therefore you find an irregular pulse what are the other investigations that you would have to do you would have to go for thyroid function test as i said that hyperthyroidism is a cause of atrial fibrillation you must check for hyperthyroidism in that patient you do cardiac enzymes sometimes when this patient present to you they might be having a cardiac complication like an mi you do echocardiography and you find the structural defect that is leading to this atrial fibrillation
and you do electrolytes and chest x-ray. So these are all the investigations that you should consider, ECG being the most important one in an atrial fibrillation patient. Coming down to the treatment of atrial fibrillation, in atrial fibrillation, there are two important concepts that you have to understand. One is rate control, one is rhythm control. What is rhythm and what is rate? The distance between the RR interval, the distance between the QRS complexes, it should be equal as I showed you in a normal ECG. That is called as a normal rhythm when the distance between the QRS RR intervals is normal. It is equal, but if the distance between the RR intervals is abnormal, when the distance is unequal, it is abnormal rhythm. So the rhythm is determined by the distance between the QRS complexes. If the distance between the QRS complexes, the RR interval is equal, it is a normal rhythm. If it is not equal, it is an abnormal rhythm. Now in a rate control, we do not control the rhythm. We do not correct the rhythm. We just control the rate at which the heart is contracting. Remember that in rate control, we just slow down the heart. We do not correct the rhythm. We just slow down the heart rate. How do we slow down the heart rate? We give either beta blocker like bisoprolol, we can give calcium channel blocker like diltiazem, or we can even give digoxin. And remember, in rate control, we have to achieve a heart rate of less than 100 to 110 beats per minute. Since the heart is running just like a horse at a very fast pace, we want to slow it down to 100 to 110 beats per minute. And if the patient is having certain comorbidities, you can do a smart thing. What you can do is that you can kill two birds with the same stone, you can treat two conditions with the same drug. If the patient is having Graves' disease and patient is having atrial fibrillation, what you can do is you can use a beta blocker because beta blocker will control the manifestations of Graves' disease and it will also control the atrial fibrillation. If the patient is having a systolic heart failure with atrial fibrillation, what you can do is you can use digoxin because digoxin will support the contraction in systolic heart failure and it will also treat the atrial fibrillation. And if the patient is having asthma or COPD with atrial fibrillation, what you can do is that you can give a calcium channel blocker because calcium channel blocker will treat the COPD as well as it will treat the atrial fibrillation. So you are actually trying to kill two birds with the same stone you are treating two conditions with a single medication. In rhythm control, we try to correct the rhythm of the heart. We try to equalize the distance between the QRS complexes. We try to bring the RR interval at an equal pace every time the heart beats. We do not care about the rate in rhythm control. In, if the rate is up to 300, we do not care about the rate in rhythm control. What we care about is that the distance between the QRS complexes, the RR interval should be equal every time the heart beats. That is called as rhythm control. Now, how can you perform rhythm control? You can perform rhythm control with electrical cardioversion in which you give the shocks to the patient. And remember, before giving shock, you must do echo to see whether there are thrombi in the heart. If there are clots in the heart, if there are thrombi in the heart, you cannot do echo because you will disloid those uh, clots and they would cause complications. So do echo first before giving shocks. In pharmacological cardioversion, what you can do is you can give flicanamide. Flicanamide is the drug of first choice. It is an antiarrhythmic used to crack the rhythm in uh, atrial fibrillation. And if there is structural heart disease in which you cannot use flicanamide, you can use IV amidarone for rhythm control. Now we'll discuss that what can be the presentation of patient with atrial fibrillation and how do you treat the patient according to its presentation. If the patient is unstable, if the patient is hypotensive, if the patient is in shock, or if the patient has heart failure or MI, in such unstable critical patient, what you have to do is that you have to straight away go for DC cardioversion. Whenever the patient is unstable and patient is having abnormal rhythm, that patient needs to be saved because that patient is going to die if you do not give the shocks. See whether it is a shockable rhythm. If the rhythm is shockable, just give the shocks and start at a 120 to 150 joules with or without amidarone. And you should consider anticoagulation when the patient is stable. How do you give anticoagulants? We'll discuss it in a while. In the second scenario, if the patient is stable and atrial fibrillation started less than 48 hours ago, this atrial fibrillation just started 
in a day or so in such patient the patient is stable the patient has a new atrial fibrillation what you can do is that you can go for either rhythm control or rate control but you can go for rhythm control in this patient usually patients are dealt with a rate control medication usually patients are given rate control but if the patient's atrial fibrillation is new and fresh you can go for rhythm control by a dc cardio version or you can also go for pharmacological cardio version with plecanamide if the patient is stable but that atrial fibrillation started greater than 48 hours ago or you don't even know the time when the patient had the onset of atrial fibrillation when the patient came to you he was having atrial fibrillation so you don't know the time when the atrial fibrillation started in such case rate control is preferred in which in rate control what you do is that you either give a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker depending upon the patient depending upon the comorbidities and if the atrial fibrillation persists you go for cardio version so these are the different scenarios in which patient can present to you if the patient is unstable go for dc cardio version catheter ablation is also one of the treatments of atrial fibrillation in atrial fib catheter ablation what you do is that you get inside the heart with a probe and you burn those areas that are generating this abnormal rhythm usually pulmonary veins are the focus of these abnormal electrical activity so you burn those areas in the pulmonary veins now a very very important point if a patient is having atrial fibrillation and abnormal contraction of the heart that abnormal contraction abnormal seizure of the atria would result in creating a turbulence in the heart turbulence in the blood that turbulence in the blood remember whenever there is turbulence in the blood it will lead to formation of clots whenever there is turbulence in the blood it will lead to formation of clots so in atrial fibrillation clots are formed and those clots get dislodged to the peripheral organs if they go into the brain they would cause ischemic stroke if they go into the limbs they would cause acute limb ischemia they would literally play havoc with the body patient would die of the complications of the clots so you have to treat the patient with appropriate anticoagulation so that patient do not develop these clots how do you give anticoagulants we have a scoring system that is called as chads 2 score in chads score you see certain things and you score the patient and you give the anticoagulants accordingly c for chf if the patient is having congestive heart failure you give patient one point if the patient is having hypertension you give patient one point if the age is greater than 75 one point if the patient is having diabetes patient gets one point if the patient has previous stroke this thing gets two point because there is increased risk of a second stroke so you calculate the score you add up the score and if the score is zero then the patient is having low risk but since the patient is having atrial fibrillation we still give aspirin so that patient has some anticoagulant effect and there is no risk of uh, clot formation if the patient is having score of one then the then the risk is intermediate and you give either aspirin or warfarin and if the score is high two or more then you give warfarin to the patient and remember whenever we start warfarin we we give it with a heparin bridge but in atrial fibrillation that heparin bridge that heparin for seven to eight days is not required you can directly start warfarin in an afib patient in summary we talked about what is atrial fibrillation it is the seizure of atria we discussed the origin and causes hypertensive heart disease being the most common one we discussed the symptoms and signs we discussed ecg changes with the absent t waves we talked about rate control we talked about rhythm control we talked about different scenarios with which the patient can present to you and how do you manage them then we talked about chad score and how do you give anticoagulants to these patients if you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on emergency medicine and cardiology bootcamp. The link of those videos is given in the description below. Thank you very much.